Good morning, church. Welcome to the Sugarland Church of Christ here on Voss Road, where we are striving to stay within the confines of God's word and operate within uh, his word, neither to the left or to the right, but stick with God's word. Thank you for being a part of our audience this day. We're truly glad you decided to be a part of our 9 a.m. Bible study. Have a great lesson on uh our uh, lesson this morning is history that will be taken from 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 10, verse 1 through 13. Uh, facilitated today will be Brother Michael Dangerfield, and uh, we just ask that you give him your undivided attention. You have a good lesson, and uh, I think we would, we would do fine. And it is a lesson that uh, he, being a facilitator, will be also a student and participant in the lesson. I uh, ask you to remember those uh, that are sick on a prayer list, uh, consult the bulletin that is several that are asked for prayer at this time, just ask you to keep them in mind. Also want to make mention of my own sister, Joyce Elaine Anderson, as she fell Friday and uh, broke her hip, but uh, uh, she went through surgery Saturday and she's doing a lot better. So just keeping your prayers. And uh, just keep the entire church in your prayers. We, uh, we're here for each other. Uh, at this time, let us go to God in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you, O oh Lord, for allowing us to call upon your holy and your righteous name. Through your Son, Jesus the Christ, who sacrificed his life, for the sins of the entire world. And Heavenly Father, we thank you for all of the many, many blessings that came along with it. your grace, your mercifulness, your Holy Spirit, your word. And Father, we just thank you for, for allowing us to be here this day in the right frame of mind to know that on the first day of the week, we collectively come together and to worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray, Father, for the Bible study this morning, ask you to bless all that are here, participants, and all that are online, that we all um, glean your word and we will uh, take from it that which is full to our spirit and go from this place and be better servants in your kingdom. Ask your blessing upon the man serving by the danger field as he about the bring the lesson to us that you give him a recollection of that which he studied and prepared, that he might teach Christ and him crucified. Lord, we also pray for this great nation, asking you to bless those that are in high places. Help them, dear Father, to make the decision that are good for all of mankind, whether it be here locally, state, or nationally. And we pray, Father, just ask you to bless those among us that are sick, Asking you, O Lord, to heal them speedily. Comfort those in our midst that are bereaved. Allow them to know that joy do come in the morning if they hold on to your unchanging hand. And Father, we just ask you to be with us through this lesson, through this day, that our mind is stayed upon you. Please forgive us of our sins, whether they be a thought or some deed. Hold them not against us in this life or that which is to come. We give you thanks and praise. These and other blessings we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Morning, everybody. Morning. How y'all feeling this morning with this uh, this weather? Okay. Well, we we're not in the summer yet, right? We're still in spring. There's like this winter out there. But the difference is too close to me. Wanted to make sure that y'all are this students. <laughs> make sure that y'all are attentive. I need to turn it down a little bit. Or? That's fine. Okay. Yeah. So, so yesterday we um, yesterday we had a teachers workshop. Um, and 
I see several faces from yesterday, and some of you all didn't get a chance to participate. And uh, it was it was really good. It was informative, and um, you know, there's a lot of educators in the room. My wife, you know, so I met Jason to a lot of education. Um, I told myself I would never be a teacher. You know, I've been in the military in wartime, but teaching was something. At least in the, in the school system, it's something that I was into. Um, but yesterday, I got to learn some of the tips and tricks, you know, from those individuals who are used to kind of laying out curriculum and making sure classroom etiquette is set up and the lesson is designed in such a way that it's received by you know everybody. It's not a whole lot of distractions and such. The only challenge was I was scheduled to go this morning to teach, and my lesson I've been working on it for you know some time, and so I'm like, oh man. <laughs> Now I got all these people in the room who are going to be great based on the rubric, you know, of all these things. But, you know, everybody's like, you got it, Mike? Yeah. I'm like, oh, man. Fresh is on, right? Fresh is on. So, so yeah, um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to uh, do my best to incorporate some of those things that we learned because I think that's important. Um, and, and if you were in attendance and you were aware of some things, you know, share them because I think that would help the conversation. I think that would help the class. The goal is for this to be dynamic. Right, for me not to be up here lecturing, but us to have a healthy Bible discussion and us to be able to pull some things out. So, all right, with that said, let's get into it. Um, the last time you guys saw me up here um, facilitating and teaching was quite some time ago, um, actually before the new year. Um, and I was much more mobile. I was moving around, I like to move around, I like to kind of talk. Um, since then, I've had a pretty significant foot and ankle surgery, and so if you see me sitting down, it's not because I'm, you know, bored or trying to, you know, like, check out the jobs because you can't stand for too long. But we're not going to let that stop us from having a fruitful prayerfully Bible class. Um, I was given the, the lesson this morning to talk on um, history. And so we're going along in the, the Gospel Advocate Companion, if you have it. If not, no worries. I pulled from it a little bit, but I deviated. I'll be honest with you, I deviated quite a bit because, you know, the structure provides, the, the Gospel Advocate lesson provides some good meat context. But I like to really get into some application and us, us to be able to make the live. So if you're following along, don't be discouraged. I'll pull some points, but not very many. All right, so... Um, uh, as y'all see, objectives, that was one of the things we talked about yesterday. Make sure you got some objectives that you kind of lined out early on. I don't know how well written they are, but I try, all right? So here, so here are some, some objectives that we have for class today. Um, I would try my best for us to get through them because I think it's good to have some, some direction, but I'm much, I'm much more interested in, in us being able to have some, some dialogue and, and me being able to learn with y'all and, and vice versa. So if we get to it all, great. If not, no worries. So we'll start off with kind of some 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 self-reflection. I have you know, the therapist in me forces me to do some things when I'm in a position to, to facilitate a lead to get us to really channel some things that we've experienced and lend that to the Word of God as well because we don't have to look just at the Bible to see what they experience. God has allowed us to go through some things too. And if we're, you know, mindful and aware, we can we can see how God has worked for us. So we'll do a little reflection. Um, and then we'll get into the text, which is First Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 13. Not a very long passage. Um, broken down into kind of three areas. One is looking back at the provision and blessings of God, um, the application then and the application now, and then we'll kind of close with God's promise, right? And at any point, y'all stop me if y'all have questions or thoughts or anything you want to add. All right, so question, question on the floor or questions on the floor. Um, there's a lot of cliches and a lot of talk about history. Um, people would say, if you don't know your history, you don't know where you're going. Like, you don't know what's going to happen in the future. But what say you? What would you say are some of the benefits to knowing your history. And when I say your, I'm not just saying your as a person, I'm saying perhaps as a person or you know, culturally or you know, uh, in terms of your family or familial. What do you think are some of the benefits to knowing your history? And not everybody at once. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. I think if you know your history, then you, you know that you are more familiar with yourself and, and position or the place that you have in life. You need to know, 
how you got to where you are. <laughs> and it's usually not all about what you do, it's about, you know, like I say, your family, your your environment. You need to you need know the past. Yeah, yes. Yeah. What, what I heard you say in, in kind of a nutshell is it's tied to your identity to some degree, right? Like knowing who you are and who you want to become who you are is tied to what you've been through. Yes, sir. Yeah, knowing the history is, you know, they always say that if you don't know your history, you're going to repeat it. So right. A lot of times, if you, uh, you know, come up through the ranks and, you know, work hard, you remember the things you went through and you try to share that with other people on how to be successful. You also want to uh, not repeat those bad things that you went through. Yeah. But we all have issues that we, you know, regret. And so <laughs> we have to uh, make sure that we don't repeat that and then teach our family and children to not go through the same thing. Absolutely. We, we see the Bible is replete with examples of what people went through, right? So so that we don't necessarily have to go through it. That's right. I've, I've heard it said, um, and maybe y'all heard this say too, where people say experience is the best teacher. Have y'all heard that? Yes. Um, one of, one of uh, the rap artists I listen to, a Christian rap artist, he says, um, he says, experience is the, the teacher of fools. And I'm like, that makes sense, right? Because why, why go through it <laughs> unnecessarily if you know if you can learn from somebody else who's been through it? And so, so experience is great, a great teacher, but if you can avoid, you know, running your head into the brick wall multiple times because somebody else did, why not? That's the other that's just the heart. That's no, I was going to say on a different line, and you got to know who your people are because uh, at one time. I was about to date my cousin. Oh, yeah. That's important to so know. So you got to know who your people are. Mm -hmm. uh, pay attention. That's true. That's true. You know, it's, it's I don't know, this this world is, is interesting now. You know, as you see um, these generations, the further we go, um, millennials, Gen Z, I think I actually fall into the millennial category, like one of those. The Gen Z, there's a there's a lack of social interaction. I mean, people are not really talking face to face and mingling and getting to know each other. Everything is virtual. Everything is all these different degrees of, of connection through the internet and stuff. And and so this is the hardest part. Point. Sometimes there's a loss of just that familial connection. Or who are your people? Where you come from? Where, you know, what's your roots and all that kind of stuff. So so it is good. It is good to to know you know some about your history. It definitely helps you to think about what's what's what may come in the future and how to prepare yourself or help others, right? Flip side of that, what are, what are some of the drawbacks? What would you say are some of the drawbacks of focusing, keyword focusing on, on your history in the future? Yes, sir. Well, I think uh, to focus on your history, I think it's easy to Days I hope define my my future because I'm familiar with the writer that says, "Come follow me, and I'll take you to a new place and a new thing, and I'll do a new thing." Mm -hmm. like, and it doesn't look like my yesterday's was. 
what God said, I'll take you to a place and it won't sound like, it won't taste like, it won't look like. Right. And if I'm not willing to turn loose, because I would drag my yesterdays into my todays and board my future. <laughs> so we have to be willing to, uh, you know, sometimes allow my my yesterdays to be, to teach me and aim me and guide me, but it doesn't find me. Absolutely. Because if it, I allow that to be that, God's voice is lost. Because often he'll say, no, but we're going to do a brand new thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I can't get you there if you won't turn this to that. I rem I'm reminded one time, he says, I got something to show you, but you can't go. I'm like, I didn't make no sense to me. And he, what he was saying to me, you know, until you turn loose of the Daryl Hughley, you know, I can't take you to the place that I have ordained concerning you and speak to you because you, you won't receive it. So he was telling me, let yesterday go and, and come follow me because I have a plan and a vision and a purpose concerning your life and that's not it. And it's hard for you to see, like you said, what God might have for you if you're locked into what you're familiar with, what you're used to. I mean, we saw that with Abraham, mm -hmm. we saw that with Moses. I mean, you can almost look at most biblical individuals and see that there was some familiarity with what they knew, but God called them to do something different. That, you know, just so you know, that wasn't just for Bible people, right? That's that's <laughs> that's for us too. That's for us too. So, That's true. You make a good point, Sister Anderson. Um, I like to say I was in the church nine months before I was born. Uh, <laughs> so, I grew up basically in the church, um, and, and I've been, you know, kind of acculturated to the church. Now, the good thing was I had the opportunity to get in the military and travel and, and see how other people do things and prove for myself that this is what God has ordained, you know, a lot. Um, but but that was that was good for me because that almost had an advantage. I feel like you know, in school, the church did a good job of making me. I have to stand up and present on Bible class and, and read the word and all that. I, you know, I, I applied that to school, so I feel good at talking in front of people and stuff like that. All right, a couple of hands over here. I see one in the back first. Or right, we'll better put a story like an in your sister. Let's go. Oftentimes, things happen in our past that, that hurt us, and if we don't learn to deal with that, we can be stuck back there. I guess you as a therapist can best, best deal with that. We need to get help all the time so we can get, get out of our past. Because uh, the past does hurt, but I often talk about the difference between the scab and, and the scar. You're going to have a scar from, from all your life, but it no longer hurts to take it. But until the scab, it still hurts. Yeah. So we have to get healed by past. Many things, we, if we get about stuck back there, because we're we'll never be able to live our life, help a healthy life. So we need to get help. So, so it's dangerous to just get stuck in the past. We get help so we can get, 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 get healing and live our life in a healthy way. Amen. Amen. I, I wholeheartedly endorse that statement by Brother uh, Spurlock. I think that um, if we're honest, as Christians, <laughs> us being able to truly worship and experience truth, truly being able to worship and experience truth allows us, or, or will force us to have to examine some of that stuff from our past that we have not dealt with, right? Because we're coming half heartedly to God, if we're being honest. And God wants, you know, us to be prostrate before Him. So. Um, yeah, we we don't know our history. We never know who we are because we don't know where we are going and where we end. Up. Nobody knows where we end up, but at least we can try because of what we have learned from where we are coming from, so that we can go forward and pass on what we know to others. So it's a continuing process. So it's important that we go back to things that we used to because we weren't always like this with all these facilities Absolutely. and things we have now. It was a different time. 
I, I often said to, said to my um, grandchildren, oh Lord, thank God for the person who um, machine to wash the clothes. Oh, yeah, because yeah, yeah. I don't know, <laughs> gone are those days, and that's part of our history, yeah. where we are. In different, I just use that as an, as an example, but you know, that's history coming up. You were born, you were and it helps us to go where we want to go, as everybody has been saying, and, and make you as a person with the help of God. Yeah, and, and, and like you said, as well as the discovery of man, you being able to help future generations. Right? Yeah. And we see that throughout the Old Testament where God was intentional about saying, don't forget. Don't forget, don't forget, right? Because I, I, I don't I don't want y'all to lose sight of me. Yes, and I think that's something that has been happening to us. We aren't passing on anything. Mm -hmm. We are so focused and grateful. Right. I, think. I don't know if we are really grateful as we ought to be for the, the things we have now. Because even when we complain about not having we are so wealthy. Absolutely. Absolutely. We are so wealthy because we forget our history and where we were. And we don't forget we the are one who's in control yes. of all things. We, so we and that's that. why I think <clears throat> our children, our grandchildren, are having such a hard time because they see everything is there, not knowing how their poor fathers right. struggle. And that is our history. It is. It we is. don't like to talk about it because we don't want anybody to know. Oh, we had that was my past. That <laughs> was my past. Right. But I'm one of those persons who like to laugh about my past. Yeah, yeah. You can't have it's your own body. Yeah, you can't have your own body. Washing my clothes, getting <laughs> water. Those are my past. It's, yeah. it's amusing. And then I said, thank you, Lord. I have to go back. There's a washing word. So you make you make a great point, uh, Sister Scoffrey, about no one being able to look back and learn from mistakes and, and the humor of it all and, and being able to trace it and help us move forward. That's that's exactly what we're gonna talk about in First Corinthians 10 this morning. Um I'm gonna go through this. I want y'all to see it because maybe this is something you can do on your own time. Was it I kind of missed the hand. Was that hand? Oh, I'm sorry, yes, ma'am. Uh I look at it like this. Uh, life is like a deja vu. It's going to keep coming around and coming around. If you're not trying to fix what is done, every time you come around, it's going to be the same thing, but much worse. Right? But if you start to make that change, you see your cross door. And you may be just show friends and family that these things go like that. This already happened out there. Mm -hmm. We lived through <clears throat> So therefore, they, as it comes back around to them, and you don't got that at it, you just share with them. It's that's history. That's his history in itself, absolutely, absolutely. Um, right smack dab in the middle of what you're saying, of us sometimes going around in a circle is the idea of God providing us with this and giving us opportunities to demonstrate and do what's pleasing him or not, you know. We can continue to ignore him and perhaps continue to wander in the wilderness, no pun intended, right? But when we choose to do what's pleasing him, then he can use us as an opportunity to bless us. Amen, I believe that wholeheartedly. Um, so, this idea was to you all to make it personal. Think about something from your history, like a significant moment that you experienced, right? Um, somewhere where you had to make some kind of decision and you didn't really know what the outcome was going to be. You grappled with it a little bit. And, and you can do this in your own time. But I almost guarantee you, if you take the time to think about that tough decision, what you did, regardless of the outcome, you can trace God. You know, sustaining you in that process, right? Maybe you was worried and it turned out good, or maybe you was worried and it didn't turn out so good. But here you are present, still alive, and as well as you are. And God has been the one that's in the, in, in the midst. So so that's kind of the backdrop of 
what I want us to look at today as we talk about uh, First Corinthians um, chapter two. All right, let's see. And if any one of you all kind of want that scenario or anything to think about, let me know. I can make sure you know. Um, what does history as shared in the Word of God through Scripture do for the believer? One of the, one of the verses that I, uh, that was drilled into us as kids um, in the church I grew up in was uh, Romans chapter 15 and verse 4. And you might know this verse from like maybe King James Version or whatever, right? Different versions. But here's, here's the idea. Paul says, for whatever things were written in earlier times, or aforetime, as you may remember that, was written for our instruction, so that through perseverance and encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. And that hope is not the idea of what the world thinks as hope. Like, I hope things get better. I hope that, you know, this is the idea of Jesus being the hope, salvation, eternal life, right? Um, now, now, may the God who gives perseverance and courage grant you to be of the same mind with one another according to Jesus Christ. So I want y'all to think about this in, in connection to what we'll read here shortly in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Right. Um, what's your question there? Um, and I'm sure you're going to get to this, but it just, uh, to me, <laughs> it uh, when thinking about the uh, especially the, the Old Testament, things about the Old Testament, we get to see our history. We get to see the uh, chosen and how they um, were given commands and what they did with those commands, how they were uh, protected and provided for and what they did with that and just how they lived their lives as well. And so for us, for me today as you know a believer, it helps me to learn from those things that they did. When I when I read about it, I read it and I try to learn how to do better. I learn um, some encouragement from you know what happened with them, so that if I do fall off or whatnot, knowing that you know I can get it back right. And um, also recognizing um, that. These were real people, right? And real, and they went through real things, just as we went through, it, just as we go through today. So it just kind of helps to put a, um, I guess, meaning to what life looks like now. Absolutely, absolutely. The connection between Old Testament or, or biblical people, not fictional characters, but actual people who live, and the connection to us is Bible tells us that we're written epistles as well, right? Written epistles, written all men. So we might look at people in the Bible and say, oh man, that was, why did they do that? That was smart. But the truth is, if, you know, we were on display right now, somebody could examine what we've been doing and, you know, kind of judge us as well. So, all right, let's take a look at, um, you know, where we are in this text. So, um, past couple of weeks leading up to now, we've talked about 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and 1 Corinthians chapter 9. The context of what we're reading in 10 actually starts back around chapter 8. And so that's something that's important to know because it seems like it was a different topic altogether, but it was adjacent. Paul talking to the, the Corinthian church, which was a fairly young church stationed in a place where there was a lot of pagan worship, there was a lot of false gods, there were new people, there were Jews, God's chosen people, and Gentiles in the same place. Right? So you can imagine there's these customs that the Jews, you know, had a strict law, and then there's people who are, who are new to understanding what it is that God would have them to do all in the same place. So, so there's all, all this confusion. So 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1, Paul is, starts off responding to, you know, a question about food offered to idols. So we talked about that in the past, right? We talked about, I think it was the last lesson, God and goals. We talked about what that looks like, right? Um, and then in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul kind of talks about himself and saying, hey, like, like I'm an apostle, you know, I have this pedigree. God blessed me to, gave me a mission to go in and preach and teach. I have liberties, but I'm not going to use those liberties. I'm not going to use those freedoms that God gave me to create a stumbling block for somebody else. You know, the parallel is the Jews were there. They were the people of God. Gentiles were coming in there new. They got to cohabitate. So it's like, hey, y'all got to work together. Like, you can have all the knowledge in the world, but if you don't know how to, you know, move with love, 
and, and esteem others better than, than yourself and consider that, then it's not going to amount to anything. So, you know, kind of transition where Paul said he became all things to all men with the hope to save some. So, that's, that leads us up into 1 Corinthians chapter 10, where Paul is sitting down talking to this church, this, this church with all this division and all these concerns that have been established not too long before. He's trying to help set some things straight. So I believe this text kind of starts more appropriately with 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 26 and 27, and it segues into chapter 10. So it says, um, Paul is talking to them, he says, Therefore I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air, but I discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. So when you're looking at like a race or you're looking at like a boxing match or something like that, you're thinking of a test. You're thinking of something that's a challenge, right? In order for you to be successful in that challenge, you got to have some level of discipline. And so when you think about what Paul will talk to this Corinthian, you know, church, starting, starting in chapter 10, let that be kind of the mindset. He's talking about discipline and intentionality, lest you fall. Right? You think yourself too hard and you think yourself you think that you got it, but have discipline and integrity because you have to be mindful of other people, you have to be mindful of your posture before God, etc. So let's let's go through these verses, uh first Corinthians 10, uh, 1 through 13. We'll kind of talk through. I don't know, if this is super small, y'all can see it's small on my hand, but can y'all see this pretty good? Okay. All right, let's look at um, Kind of first objective, looking back at the provision and blessings of God, this is kind of what Sister, Sister Dangerfield was talking about. So God showed himself faithful to the children of Israel um, as he led them from Egyptian bondage. We know that you know, God used Moses to take the children um, of Israel um, from oppression in Egypt into the promised land. So in verse 1, Paul says to, the, to, to these believers here at the Corinth, he says, For I do not want you to be unaware or ignorant of, or unlearned, right? Brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, right? He's referencing Moses at that time, taking them through, um, through uh, uh, out of Egyptian bondage. Verse 2 says, And all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Now, now people might say that we're baptized and think about present and, and not so much what it was referring to in the past. Right, the people, the people were not taken into the, the, the Jordan or the Red Sea and, and literally dumped, you know, by Moses. That's not that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about this idea of the salvation of God came through Moses if the people had committed to what it is that he was trying to get them to do. So this attachment, this connection, this immersion in what it was that Moses was sent to do by God. Now the parallel is today. We are baptized into Christ, both physically, right, in the water, but there's also still this tie, this commitment to follow what it is that he has established for us to do because that's what God gave it. That was his purpose. So there's a connection from history. You see a lot of foreshadowing that happens. There's a connection from history. From that Old Testament, Paul talking to these Corinthians, um, which first, first century um, church early on, but referring back to people in the time even past. We're sitting here in 2024 reading something that Paul talked to early church individuals about something that happened even before then. So you see how, as we talk about history, there's this continuity that has to happen, right? And, and God is the one that sustains it all. Yes. You see the foreshadowing of the salvation? Absolutely. The, uh, the Israelites were were saved by going through the water from the slaughter of the Egyptians. Yep. God has some foreshadowing uh, uh, for us for, 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 to, look, to look back and see how, how, how he saved them and how he will also save us. Absolutely, absolutely. He took them from a place of, we can say comfort, right? I mean, they were oppressed, but we saw where they gave Moses a hard time all the time. When they ran into something that was unfamiliar because they were stuck in their past. It was, you know, at least we had, you know, food. At least we had this, right? Yeah, but y'all cried about 
be the prince. And God, God heard y'all prayers and said, let's take you up. That's one of the drawbacks to this ministry. Yes, ma'am. I was going to say, and it's still us today, we we allow ourselves to be oppressed, you know, with a lot of different things. Because um, even, even, <laughs> Tom, you know, right? um, even um, with us being in a uh, part of the church and living our daily lives, you know, a lot of us uh, do <clears throat> sacrifice ourselves to worldly things or to worldly people to allow ourselves to be put in positions to do better, to get money, to be financially stable or to be emotionally in a relationship committed, you know, or whatnot. We sacrifice a lot of the things that, you know, we should be put into debt, sin. We sacrifice a lot of that and we tell ourselves, well, at least I'm in a relationship or at least I'm making money. At least I can support my family. At least I have these degrees. At least I can do this. At least I can do that. And we forget to trust, you know, we forget to abide by uh, God's will and trust that, you know, if we just do what we're supposed to do, all those things are going to be covered anyway. And so we, we see that how they did it more physically, you know, in wanting to go back to Egypt, although they were oppressed, but it was okay. Well, at least we had food. Well, at least we had somewhere to stay. At least we, you know, but you were living under pagans. You were living, uh, you know, under someone that was oppressing you, and it was not right. right. And we, we, we still offer ourselves today the same thing. Uh, you're really teaching a lesson, Tim. Um, <laughs> let, let me let me fast track this because I saw that warning. Again, time on my face. So Tara said some key words. I heard sacrifice. Right? I heard the things, the, the status and all those kind of things. What does that remind you of? Idolatry. Right? That was that was what was at the core of what Paul was talking to this this uh body in these verses. Idolatry. Right? What is what is idolatry? Anybody? What are you used to hearing? What do you think about when you hear idolatry? Idolizing. Idolizing. Something that you worship. Yeah. Something that you worship. Okay. Anybody else? Other than God. Yeah. Other. Worship other than God. anything other than God. Yeah. Worship anything other than God. Yeah. Devotion. Devotion. Yeah. So, so we often like to attribute, you know, idolatry to this maybe created thing, right? This this thing that we are seeing or we give this attention to. Listen to what Paul says in Colossians three and five. He says, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desires, and covetousness, which is idolatry. So, so we will often attribute this idea of putting something else before God, and whatever that thing is, whether it's money, a job, a jewelry, or whatever. But the idea of sexual immorality, the idea of impurity, um, evil desires, all of that falls into the scope of what idolatry is. Why? Because we allow ourselves to be devoted to a thing and therefore not trust in God. So if you look at the, the text between 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 10, Paul is saying God provided people in the past with all these things, spiritual food, you know, spiritual drink. You know, they essentially had Christ who was a rock. He was taking care of them. But what did they do? They started to, to grumble. They started to complain. They had evil desires. They had sexual immorality. They had all this stuff. Isn't that exactly what Paul said in his idolatry? It was that their hearts had shifted from trusting in God to these things. In fact, when Moses went up to, to get the commandments from God, what did, what did they do? They, they, built a, they built an idol, right? They, and they started worshiping. We need you something to say that this is what really took us out. So, so what's what's the connection for us? Like if we are not careful, we will allow the, the things, right? We will perhaps allow things from our history, what our forefathers didn't get, what our family didn't get. Oh, I'm striving, I gotta do better. Like nobody in my family graduated, so I need to make sure I got all the degrees and I got all the money and I got all the businesses, right? Like it sounds that's good. That's ambitious. But if it, if it puts you in a position of where you lose sight of God, 
then you are falling victim to idolatry and you're losing sight of what it is that we are to do as Christians. Yeah. Well, another thing I think was bombarded uh, every day by the world in, in order to uh, get recognition or even street credit <laughs> is to have uh, these things right. that the world say you got to have. And even in the church, uh, we kind of have a divided Lord on Sunday. We are right. Yeah. But Monday through Saturday. Uh, I like it. it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Brother Dundee, Brother no, we have to wrap up. I'm sorry. That's how this is about. It ended up on 7th. We have got to be very careful in what we do. The people sat down to eat, yep. drink, and rose up. You know, that's an actual reference to what they did to yeah. to the, the golden calf that was yes, created. So we can reference the same thing for us. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm good, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys so much for your participation. I will lead this out in prayer. Um, let's pray. Lord God, we thank you so much for this opportunity as, as family, as brothers and sisters, as, as those who are interested and eager to know more about you and what you have called us to do. Uh, we thank you for bringing us throughout this past week. Uh, we pray that uh, as we um, prepare to enter worship collectively, that we can reflect on those things that you have done for us, reflect on those things that you would have for us to do, Father, and just be able to give you the praise and the glory um, during this time. We ask that the things that were shared this morning um, in this discussion, in this study, Father, were, were glorifying to you uh, um, edifying to us and then can help, you know, stir up our desire to know more about what you would have us to do. We love you and we thank you and we ask all of this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen.